Hello, and welcome to Rock Creek Online. Thank you for joining us today. In just a moment, we're going to hear a great talk. But first, take a minute and let us know where you're watching from. As you watch today, we want you to know that we've been praying for you, and we believe God is going to speak to you through today's teaching. Just a reminder, if you're ever in the Marysville area, we would love for you to join us in person for church. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's teaching. And thank you for making Rock Creek a part of your spiritual growth. Hey, Rock Creek Church, welcome again to another weekend. We're so glad you joined us wherever you're watching and from, maybe your living room, your car. Hey, listen, if you're watching in your car right now, pull over, then keep watching. Uh, maybe you're on our YouTube page, Facebook, website. Hey, if you're on social media, just do us a quick favor. Let us know where you're watching from, who you're watching with, and maybe a highlight of your week. We're so glad, again, you made Rock Creek a part of your spiritual growth. We're in the middle of this teaching series called Life. And, and uh, we, we kind of subtitled it, Fake It or Fix It, uh, because here's why. A lot of people, uh, we've experienced it, and maybe you'll connect with this thought today, that, that there's pressure to put on a facade, to act like you have it all together. And so we fake things in life instead of allowing the Spirit of God to fix the areas that are broken in our life. And so this has been a really good teaching series as we've kind of talked about some very specific areas uh, in our lives as human beings, like stress last week, um, anger. I mean, we're just kind of getting into everyone's business. And so today we're talking about uh, truth, integrity, honesty. So I entitled today's teaching, uh, I Want the Truth. I Want the Truth. I have three young kids. And, uh, and they're amazing. Uh, but, but what we've discovered with all of them is that they are naturally born uh, to be liars. <laughs> like it's just in them. And if you're a parent, you'll connect with that. Like there's just something about human beings when they're born, they have a propensity towards uh, being sinners, uh, being liars. And so uh, I never forget we were asking our, our, one of our kiddos, hey, did you do this? And they looked at us with all sincerity and honesty and said, no. And now here's the deal, as a parent, we knew that they were lying. So we asked them again, did you do this? And they said, no, we didn't. And so we asked them again, are you, are you telling the truth? And they looked at us with the same sincerity as the answer before, no, we're not, I'm not telling you the truth. I go, so um, you're telling the truth about lying, but you still lied. Y yes. <laughs> so isn't it funny, human beings, and, and maybe you're an adult watching today and you're like, actually I've done that before. There's something about our humanness that gives us a propensity to live a life that actually moves away from God. But once you become a Christian, once you put your faith and trust in Jesus, there should be a new desire inside of you that, that drives you towards God, not away from. But there are still some areas in our life that we gotta shore up. And, and one of those areas I have, have, have experienced in my own life, and, and you'll probably connect with this, that there are some moments where culture says it's okay to bend the truth, which actually isn't the truth anymore. And so we're gonna tackle that today. Uh, I recall growing up, uh, learning about history, and there was this amazing story about George Washington, famous president, uh, American history, like awesome, uh, how he chopped down a cherry tree. His dad asked him the story, hey, did you do this? You know, he'd gotten a new ax for his birthday. He goes, I could not tell a lie, right? You've probably heard this story growing up, learning about history. I could not tell a lie. Now here's the funny thing about that story. That story is a lie. And it was made up from a guy who was actually writing books, and he thought, this will be great. I'll tell a, a, a story about this guy that's not true to tell the truth, to sell the truth, right? So again, culture, it's nothing new. It's been happening for a while, it's been happening, it'll probably continue to happen, but us as Christians, we're gonna pursue a life of integrity, a life that's honest, a life that's transparent, a life that's not fake, but a life that has been fixed by 
Jesus. And so here's our theme scripture for this entire teaching series. It comes out of John 10, 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now here's the story. There is a thief. We call him the devil or Satan. You may not believe in him, but he believes in you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life so that you'll do nothing important, nothing significant for uh, the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so if you're a Christian, you just need to know it. Uh, his whole goal is to get you to be discouraged, distracted, delayed, and ultimately destroy any hope of you fulfilling your potential. But Jesus says, I have a different route for you. I have a different plan for you. I have a different purpose for you. It's to give you a rich, not rich in the sense of money, although that would be nice, rich in the sense of full, hope-filled, robust, overflowing life, and it's gonna satisfy you. It's gonna satisfy their, their, the very depths of your heart and your soul, and eventually as it satisfies the inner you, it affects the outer you. And so a lot of our conversation may include some behavioral patterns that lead to destruction. Uh, but a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is actually the, the inner you, the, the inside you, the, the inside you that no one sees but affects the outside you. Look what it says in Exodus 20, verse 16. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. Uh, another way to say this is, hey, don't be a liar. Uh, you could say it this way, this is the Pastor Brian translation. Uh, tell the truth at all times. We have this motto in our family, the whole truth, the whole time. Write that down, it'll help you and your family. The whole truth, the whole time. So it's the whole truth, the whole time. It's not half truth, it's not a quarter truth. It's, it's the full truth, it's the whole truth, the whole time. Because you must not testify falsely. It's very clear, commands in scripture. Be a person that's honest, that's truth-filled or truthful. See, if you're full of truth, you'll have a truth-filled life. But, but culture tells us it's okay to bend the truth, that truth is subjective, truth is whatever you want it to be. My truth is my truth, and that's not the reality of living a Christian life. Pursuing Jesus means there is a truth that transcends our here and now. But, but if we're not careful, if we don't evaluate our Christianity, our growth spiritually, we'll end up looking like the world instead of looking like Christ. And so I thought I would just share with you like what I would call five common lies, and maybe today as you're watching, you're taking notes, you just check the boxes where you, um, where you just uh, recognize these in your life. And the first one is calculated lie. This is the lie uh, for many of you who have sold stuff on OfferUp or eBay or, or, or Home. And you're like, we have three other offers, so you, you better make sure you get your offer in full ask, right? Like, hey, by the way, you know, I, I only have this $20. Come on, some of you wheeler and dealers at the garage sales, I only have 20. In reality, we all know you have 100 in your pocket, but you're like, I, you know, this is all I have. And so you get the item, but you lied. <laughs> Somebody like, whoa, Pastor Brian, you're, you're just really, that's just so over the top. But, it, but it's the truth. So here's the interesting thing about, about human beings. If we're not careful, we'll allow our life to actually look very much like the world when the Bible, it's not in your notes, says this, we're to be in the world, but not of the world. So what I'm asking you is to evaluate where you're at. Have you become the person with calculated lies? So that you actually become a person who doesn't live out truth. Remember, it's the whole truth the whole time. Here's the second one, the cruel lie. Um, this is the one uh, what I call revenge, right? Your coworker steals your idea, claims it as their own, they get the promotion instead of you, and so you start spreading uh, the, the water cooler rumors about them. Like, this is the, the, the revenge moment. You, you tell a, a lie that's cruel, it's, it's devious, it's, it's intentional, to bring hurt. Uh, I, I wrote it this way, that revenge is what I enjoy doing to the people who, who hurt me. It's a beautiful, destructive definition of revenge. What I enjoy doing to the person that hurt me. Again, it's not in your notes, but the scripture declares to you and I that vengeance or revenge is the Lord's. And so his revenge, his vengeance is perfect, ours is corrupt, it's human, it's, it's not spiritual, it's, it, it's got bad intentions, and so the, the goal is not to tell cruel lies, to get revenge, we have to start telling the whole truth the whole time. Here's the third one, convenient lies. 
Okay, convenient lies. Uh, and here's the convenience, and this will sneak into your, uh, you're at a party, and, and the par- party is boring. And, and, and so you go, hey, by the way, oh man, our sitter just called, and, and the kids are acting up, so we're just gonna have to head out early. Oh, no problem, no problem, right? So you, you conveniently lied about the kids, because the pain of telling a person that their party was horrible and so boring, you wish you could be doing anything else, including watching your own children when you got a sitter. Like, but guess what, that's still a lie. It's a convenient lie. You're avoiding the pain of the truth. Come on, and that's a nice pain. There are other convenient lies we we're telling that we are trying to avoid the pain of the truth, and so we tell a lie. But in reality, God is asking, the Bible is declaring to us that we are to live the whole truth the whole time. Here's the fourth one, the cowardly lie. This is, a, this is avoiding the punishment. This, this is making sure you tell lies so that you don't deal with the consequences, right? Like, my dog ate my homework. Come on, students, if you're watching today. Oh, there was a horrible accident on the freeway. I'm sorry I'm late to the boss that you showed up an hour late to work. When in reality, you, you, you just slept through the alarm. Now, I know some of you are watching and you're like, wow, like these, these, these little lies you're talking about seem so inconsequential. And, and let me just tell, you, tell it to you straight, because I love you and I'm your pastor. It's not the one little lie that makes the big difference. It's the, it's the little lies adding up that make the compound interest uh, problem in our character. And so if character matters to be like Christ, when we begin to allow little lies to become a part of our everyday life as human beings, as, as followers of Jesus, eventually it's going to cause major rifts and issues, and ultimately it'll allow the enemy of our soul, the thief, to still kill and destroy what God wants to do. Cowardly lies is, is, is still a lie. And so our whole goal is what? The whole truth, the whole time. And here's the uh, last one, the conceited lie. This is uh, uh, exaggerated accomplishments, also known as your resume, right? Like, <laughs> this is exaggerated ac- accomplishments or exaggerated things that, that make you sound better than you are. Uh, a lot of times we see this, um, if you're an employer, uh, when you interview in resumes, you're like, wow, you're like Jesus, you're like a superhero based off of this resume, and then you realize that, that it's a lot of exaggerated lies. Right, And so we gotta remember the whole truth the whole time and whether it's a calculated lie, a cruel lie, a convenient lie, a cowardly lie, a conceited lie, it's all a lie. It's all not honest, it's all not truth. And remember, Exodus tells us you must not testify falsely. Be truth-filled and truthful. The whole truth, the whole time. And if you will live this way, what I'm telling you is that your life will have less stress. We talked about stress last weekend, and there's a lot of clinical psychology around this idea that actually a truthful person lives a more uh, stress-free, peace-filled life. That actually one of the greatest indicators of a stress-filled person is actually a life that, that's filled with lies, a life that doesn't live truthfully, a life that lives what we call a double life, where one person sees you one way, but you actually live another way. They see the outside of you, but the inside of you is filled with lies. And can I just tell you, you know why it's stressful being a liar? Because you're always having to spin the plates of what story did I tell them? What story did I tell that person? What story did I tell myself? And so all these plates representing lies that you've told, whether little or big, you're spinning and spinning and eventually your human condition gets so stress-filled that you're like, I just want the truth to come out. And so oftentimes you'll see a person that like, life gets destroyed, whether it's a public celebrity or a prominent figure, and you'll go, how did they end up this way? Well, to be honest with you, there's something about our soul that can only handle spinning the plates for so long, and eventually we look for relief. And so a lot of what you have experienced or seen maybe when a, a public implosion of a prominent figure is actually relief And although you think their life is destroyed, they're like, oh, thank God, the lies can be over. And so my prayer for you is that you would not live a double life, that you would take fully and and, and embrace this idea, this principle, this biblical truth, that actually honesty and truthfulness is God's best for you, that you would not bear false 
witness or claim or lie towards yourself, your neighbor, a loved one in this life. Because here's the biblical truth to live by, okay? Lying destroys relationships, lying damages your character, and God says don't do it. Come on, Christian. You're watching today, you're like, I want to pursue Jesus, this is it. This is the biblical truth to live by. Lying actually destroys relationships. When you lie, it erodes trust, right? And trust is the only currency of any, what I would say, any relationship, but a healthy one. And so trust is built up over time, but lying destroys trust in a moment. And so lying destroys relationships. Lying damages your character. When you begin to allow lies, both little and big, to compound, and someone looks at you and goes, man, you, you actually lie all the time. You're not a truthful person. It, it's an indictment on your character. And if we're Christians representing Christ, our character matters. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're watching it, you're like, I just saw this guy on YouTube, and I thought I would just check it out. Listen, if you're a Christian, Character matters. If you're not a Christian, right now, it doesn't really matter, but when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the Bible says we now represent Christ. And so how you live, what you do, how you represent Christ matters, which means character is important. And lying, being untruthful, damages your character, which means it damages how you represent Christ to the world in which we're called to be in, but not of. And ultimately, it's because God says, don't do that. It's not good for you. It's bad for you. It's out of bounds for you. There are guardrails to your life, and within those guardrails, it's called truth-telling. Outside of those guardrails, it's called lying, and that's not God's best for you. And so as a Christian, I know that you want God's best for you. So here, your pastor. God's best for you is to have you live a life that's the whole truth the whole time. Look at Psalm 34 says, Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. There it is. Right in our face today. Don't be a liar. Tell the truth. You want to live long and prosper, not just the I can't even do it, the, the Spock, this one today. Like, but it's not just the, that, it, it's actually more than that. It's a soul, it's a longing inside of us to live a life that's, that's prosperous in our soul, prosperous in our life. Then, then keep your tongue from speaking what is evil and your lips from declaring things that are, that are untrue, that are false, that are false. Uh, and, and here's just a side note. I put it in our notes because I think it's gonna be helpful for a lot of us today. Here's how I want you to tell the truth when you tell the truth. I want you to tell it consistently, consistently. And, and this is the habit that is formed in, in, the, in the, the, the fire, the crucible, right? Character being developed as we consistently tell the truth. That we choose not to live a double life, that we choose to, to follow Christ and let Christ be formed in us. And so the character in which we're being formed looks like Jesus and we do that consistently. We tell the truth consistently, the whole truth, the whole time. We also tell the truth lovingly. Like we actually say it in such a way that is heard, that, that, that just because it is true d- doesn't mean we need to say it in such a way that produces death in our life. Like what you're doing is so impulsive to me, it's, it's repulsive, it's, it's not, you know, like no, that, that's gonna cause problems. I put it this way, you, you can make a point without making an enemy. And so when you live a life that's full of truth and you speak truth lovingly, you gotta do it in such a way that you, you can make a point without making an enemy. Proverbs 16, 23 says it this way, intelligent people think before they speak. Some of you married people, th- this, is your, this is gonna free you today. Intelligent people, and I know there's some very intelligent people watching today. Intelligent people think before they speak. I've never regretted taking a moment, practicing the pause, and and going, "Mm, I wonder if I should say what just came into my head. Uh, No, I think I'll wait. 
right? I give it a 24 hour break. Or, or you know what I've done recently? I'll text what I was thinking about saying someone to someone that I trust and I'll go, hey, what do you think about this? Recently, I was about to make a social media post and I sent it to three of my friends and said, hey, what do you think about this? And they're like, I wouldn't post that. I wouldn't post that. I wouldn't post that, and, and so I sent it to someone a little more uh, 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 outlandish, and they're like, oh man, I would totally post that. And so I thought, I've got my decision, I'm gonna post it, I'm just kidding. I didn't post it, I deleted it. Why, because intelligent people think before they speak. It's not about just making a point. If we make a point, but we also have an enemy, if we tell the truth, but it's not kind or loving, even though it might be true, It's pointless, it's just mean. And so as Christians, we wanna pursue telling the truth consistently, but also lovingly. It's not about just being right and making a point. Oftentimes, it's actually about representing Christ in such a way that really matters. Now here's the thing, nothing new from our life now to when Jesus was alive and he was walking around the earth doing ministry. They had a lying problem back then, and, and a lot of our culture, we have a lying problem now. So let me read you a little part of Jesus' life out of Matthew chapter five. It says this, you have also heard that our ancestors were told, you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven because heaven is God's throne. And do not say by the earth because the earth is the footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem for Jerusalem is the city of the great king Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Let me explain this. There was a lying problem, just like we have today. And so they would use vows and make oaths as a way to basically excuse their behavior. But but look how Jesus wraps up his statement. Just say a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. So Jesus is like, don't use oaths and don't use vows to make yourself feel better about you lying. Just say yes, just say no. Just be honest, just tell the truth. Don't be false, don't tell a story of half truths or quarter truths or three quarter truths, just the whole truth the whole time. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I think if more Christians let their yes be yes and their no be no, we would actually represent Christ better and we would be more effective in our witness to others who don't have faith. And they will look at our life and go, man, you tell the whole truth the whole time, even when it's inconvenient, even when it might make you look in a particular way that's un, unnice, unkind, not something you would enjoy, but you tell the truth. Even when you fall short, you tell the truth. Even when you make a mistake, you tell the truth. And guess what, it represents Christ well. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, now here's the Here's the secret sauce, here's the X factor. The reality is, it's not just about our lips because what our lips speak actually comes from from within. So the real problem is not actually our mouth or or our tongue or our thinking, it's actually our heart. It's actually our heart. So the bottom line is this, that the heart of the matter is actually my heart. It's your heart, it's our heart. We don't just say whatever we think, actually we say what's What's in our heart, look at Matthew 12, 34 says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So I hate to break it to you today, but if you're a liar, it's because your heart is filled with lies. Woo. Let me just pray for everybody. <laughs> like, this is about as real as it gets. Life, either you can fake it or fix it. If you're living a double life today, with your spouse, with your kids, in your workplace, Come on, whatever area you've, you've decided to lie in, and so it looks one way, but you know reality is that's not the way that it is. It's because the heart is broken. The heart is full of not Christ-like character, but, but the humanness, the, the sin nature. Look at Matthew 15, 19 says, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. Whoo! It's a big list, it's a nasty list. And it all comes from what, from within. So I know you have a hard 
environment. I know you grew up in a tough family. I know you have circumstances and pressures from the outside, but the reality is it's not the pressure from the outside that makes you a liar. It's what's on the inside that produces the lies and the pressure. What you, what you experience is just a byproduct, but if you can get your heart right, you can get the outside right. If you can fix what's broken on the inside, and here's the truth, you can't fix it by yourself. You need a God who created you who formed you, who fashioned you, who sent his only son, Jesus, who took our place to fix what's broken on the inside so that we could represent him well on the outside. So if your heart can get right, your, your mouth will be right. If you get your heart right, your lips will speak what's truth-filled and not what's false-filled. You'll live the whole truth the whole time. You won't settle for the convenient lies or the cruel lies or the conceited lies or the calculated lies even though you might want to because God is working in your heart and transforming your heart and changing your heart. It's not a one-time experience but it's an ongoing life experience of heart transformation by the Spirit of God, the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead. As he continues to work in your heart, you'll live a life where that's the whole truth the whole time and when you don't, because we're all humans. When you fall flat and you're like, oh, I didn't just quite hit the truth on that one, it was 95%, you will have what's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit who will tell you, hey, by the way, that wasn't truth-filled. And you have another opportunity to turn back to God's path instead of your own path. But in order to get our heart right, I think we gotta ask a couple questions, three very specific questions today. Is my life quiet enough to hear from God? Is it quiet enough? In a life that's so busy, even in the middle of the pandemic, and we're coming out of that and getting back to our new normal, even in all that, am I quiet enough? Do I have enough space and and margin in my life to hear from God? Because as a Christian, what, what I'm concerned about is that the whole, like this idea of what we called, we used to call a quiet time or devotional time, um, time with God alone without distraction is, is like not vogue anymore. Like people just don't do it. It's like I'll watch a YouTube clip for three minutes, but my gosh, put me in a room with a Bible and some worship on. That's the, that's the time we worship God and, and sing to him and enjoy these moments. Like put me in a room by myself, quiet, whoo, no, I can't handle it. It's too much, it's too quiet. And that's the whole point, my friends, is that you would tune out the world and you would tune into God and you would be a quiet moment where God can speak. Look at Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Stop being so busy, create some margin, schedule it in the calendar, create a space, a room, a place where you can clearly hear because you're quiet, you're still. It's only my voice that you're tuning your spirit into hearing. And I think oftentimes we, we allow lies in our life, the little lies that become big lies that ultimately destroy our life because we're not quiet enough to have God go, hey, by the way, that's not best for you. Hey, by the way, when you said that, that, that wasn't actually true. Hey, by the way, you keep allowing this lie to play out and eventually it's gonna cause some devastation in your life. Be still, he says, and know that I am God. Creating margin in your life where you can tune out the world and tune in to God. Because if we don't, if we continue the fast-paced whirlwind life, where we're overscheduled and no margin, we'll not have an opportunity for, for God to do the work in our heart, which is really the issue of our life. Broken, evil, lying, impulses that are ungodly come from the heart. And it's in that still, small, quiet space that God speaks to our, to our heart. So we gotta, we gotta slow down, we gotta take some time and, and rest, and, and again, nothing new with our faith. Look, look it's the same thing that, that God was working in the original story that we see in Genesis. Look what it says in Genesis 2. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. 
And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. That word holy means to be blessed, to be set apart, to be God's and God's alone. Because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. So the question for us today, it's the fourth commandment that God tells us, hey, make sure that you rest. Make sure you create space and time to be still and know that I am God. But time to rest, that's like a cuss word in most people's lives, let alone Christians. Take time to rest, yeah. Take time to turn off the phone, be by yourself, and let God speak to you. Is your life quiet enough to hear from God? I think here's the second question we have to ask. Is my life owned by something other than God? Is my life owned by something other than God? Because here's, here's the biblical truth. God has created a space only for him in your heart. But oftentimes, well-meaning Christians, and maybe even those watching, that you'll realize that, that, that your life is actually owned by your children, by your work, by your schedule, by your investments, Come on, there, there are things in your life that have taken precedent and priority over your relationship with God, and the reason why we say the number one thing we want for you at Rock Creek Church is to know God is because that's the first foundation in which we build on. If you don't know God, he's not the owner of your life. Look what Revelations 2 says. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstands from its place among the churches. Woo! What he's saying is, hey, return to me. Come back to me. Let not, not your schedule, your kids, this world own the priority. I want to be the priority. Do what you did when I first saved you and rescued you. When I redeemed you and you were so thankful for the forgiveness that Jesus provided, like go back to that place in space and remind yourself of what's most important. Have I allowed something else to take the place of master and Lord over my life? And here's the honest truth, it's easy to do. Well-meaning Christians, I've experienced it in my own life that there has been priorities, there's been busyness, there's been things in the schedule that have taken precedent and priority, and here's the, the moment we all need to evaluate. If that's true, what do we need to stop doing to make sure that God is the owner of our life, he is Lord and master of our life, so that we can continue to hear clearly from heaven, have our heart be transformed, so that we can live the whole truth the whole time. I think the third question we have to ask ourselves is, have I f ever actually allowed myself to fully experience God's truth? See, it's one thing to know the Bible, which we believe is God's truth to us, it's, it's one thing to, to know information about God and his plan of redemption through the person of Jesus and how the Holy Spirit is at work. Jesus says, it's better that I go so the Holy Spirit can come and, and that's all well and good, Christian, that you know all that, but like, have you experienced God's truth? Has he done something deep in your heart that's actually set you free? Has he, has he done the deep work in your heart that actually gives you that new desire to want to to want to change, to want to be different, to want to grow in your faith, to want to, or is it just the, the knowledge that it's like, ah, I know, but, but, but there's, there's a gap between the knowing and the transformation that God wants for you. Look what John eight thirty two says. And you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So when you know the truth, you'll actually transform. You'll experience it. I could put it this way. Unless you're transforming, maybe you haven't experienced the truth. Because if the truth sets us free, then we gotta stop living a lie. We gotta obey God's word that says, hey, don't have a false claim. Don't be a liar. Tell the truth, the whole truth, the whole time. Live in such a way that we represent Christ well. Come on, Christian. Live in such a way that when people look at you, you go, whoa, they are free. And you'll go, the only way I'm free is because I've met the truth personified. His name is Jesus. Zephaniah 3, 17 an amazing scripture, after a moment of correction and discipline from God to his people, this is what happens. The Lord your God is with you. His power gives you victory. The Lord will take delight in you, and in his love, he will give you new life. 
He will sing and be joyful over you. So after a moment of correction in the people of God, here's what the Lord says to them. Hey, by the way, I know I corrected you. By the way, I know you've been lying. By the way, I know your life hasn't quite lined up correctly, but hey, I'm with you. I'm gonna give you power to have victory. I'm gonna take delight in you. I still love you and I'll give you the new life in which I promise. And then he will sing over you and your life will be filled with joy. This is God's promise to you. If we'll just not fake life, but allow the Spirit of God to fix our life, stop telling lies, and live the whole truth the whole time, we will experience this. And I don't know about you, but this sounds pretty good. This sounds like God's best for you. And some of you, if you were really honest, this is not what you're experiencing. You're experiencing heartache in your relationships, brokenness in your friendships, financial disaster, workplace drama, social media drama, and the reality is it's because you've allowed the little lies that have been convenient and cruel and caused you to actually live a life that's not filled with truth. But if you'll today in this moment repent, that means to turn you from your way to God's way, this will be your story. The Lord your God is with you. When you repent today, his power gives you victory to what? To live a life that represents him well. The Lord will take delight in you and his love, he will give you a newness that you have not known. And you will experience a joy that transcends your circumstances, that goes over what you're experiencing. But in order to experience this, there is a truth moment we have to arrive at today. And here's my final thought. Before you can be honest with yourself and others, you must be first honest with God. And so today, wherever you're watching from, I wanna encourage you to have that honest moment with God. Are you following Jesus? Have you committed his ways to be your ways? Have you surrendered your life to his leading, his lordship? Have, have you been saved? Have you been rescued? Have you been redeemed? Maybe today you are a Christian, but, but, but he has not been the priority. Maybe today you need to renew that commitment to making Jesus the most important person in your life. And my prayer is this, that you would have a moment where you're honest with God, and as he redeems your life and saves you and transforms your heart, then, my friends, you can live a life that's honest with others and yourself. Because ultimately, here's what we want. Here's what I want for you, Matthew 5, here's what it says. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Here's why we should live a life of honesty and truthfulness, the whole truth, the whole time, because when people look at our truth-filled life, they won't look at you, they'll see God in heaven and go, if God can do that for them, surely he can do it for me. But it starts with being honest with God of where you're at today. Are you in faith? Are you a part of the family of God? Have you said yes to following Jesus or do you need to? And so I wanna pray for you. Wherever you're watching from, whoever you're with, today, if you're ready to make a decision to follow Jesus, this is your moment to be honest with God. This is your moment to go, I'm far from God. I don't know God like I should. I'm ready to make that commitment to know him for the first time or the first time in a long time. So wherever you're watching from, whoever you're with, you just pray right after me with all the faith, that means belief, that you can muster up. Today, Jesus, I receive you as Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin, I know I've missed the mark, but I know you'll make me new. From this day forward, I'm following you and you alone. I'm living a life filled with truth, no more lies. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're now a Christian, you're now a part of the family of God. You're now what we call saved, redeemed, rescued. We wanna know that you prayed that prayer. Would you make it, just take a moment, look for the link. Let us know how we can help you walk out that decision. Get into a group, get water baptized. Coming up next weekend, we're having water baptisms right here where I'm talking to you from. It's gonna be amazing. It's a public marking and declaration of that inner decision that many of you made today to follow Jesus. Join us for water baptisms. If you live anywhere within our facilities, we'd love to help you take that next step. Again, I wanna encourage you, as you grow in your faith, come on, live the whole truth the whole time. As we wrap up today's time together, I also wanna encourage you to prayerfully consider partnering with us financially. As you give, your giving is making a difference. Not only is it a command from God to, 
to give and honor him, but it also goes and helps us as a church and a community to empower others, to equip others to, to know the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So thank you so much for your generosity. And as always, Rock Creek, you're doing better than you think. God bless.